this episode of Cars Plus, we're going to do a vlog on various projects that we're working on for ourselves and also items we're working on for other people. We're going to cover a Graham, Graham Rototiller, a Supercharger, and a special item at the end that you'll want to wait for. Here we are with a combination coupe. Now Trish will probably put up above somewhere here the video that really explains about the styling of this car that we did earlier and it'll show you that there's a great transformation since then. The entire car has now been painted. We've changed out the tires on it. That's part of the tires you maybe saw down in the corner. Just got the rear tires on yesterday. The interior is already done as was shown before. We're down to what we really need to do is have it have the louvers chromed, we have to have our window frames chromed, we have to replace our window glass, we have a vacuum leak which I'm pretty certain is the windshield washer pump that I've got to find, we have changed out the carburetor, we'll show you that real quick. We're now running a Carter ball and ball on it, I have to do final adjustments on the Carter ball and ball, that's the same sort of carburetor we are using on our 39 sedan. We had a Marvel Shebler on here. I can make it work, but the car is grossly underpowered. Not much fun to drive, so we switch carburetors. We have a few other minor tweaks to do, some adjusting, as I said, on the carburetor, but this car is getting really close to done. Over here at the back of the car, I want to show you the fender skirt. If you look closely, and you might be able to tell in the video, we can certainly tell in person, there is a mismatch in the color here. That's because the paint I started with is no longer in production. I couldn't finish the entire car in this particular paint, and even though they're both attempt matches at the exact gram color, this is probably a little closer than that one was. We will be repainting that fender skirt to make it match the rest of the car. I always tend to do something small and test it in the first place. And one of the things you can learn about how long this takes, obviously I have other parts of life going on, and I work on many other people's items for them, for their antique vehicles. But the reality is, is you can't restore a car in a week like they show you on television. That's total Hollywood. Don't believe it. It's not real. They've got a whole crew of people and the car probably doesn't work very well when it's done. It takes months to years to actually accomplish everything with one of these vehicles. Here we are with the current state of the rototiller. Now we told you in the initial rototiller video for the few people who've watched it, that we were going to try to start it in the condition it was in. When we first showed you the rototiller, we were talking about starting it up in its rough condition. But, as you can see, we've taken a few things apart, largely because down here you'll see an entire oil slick. And we came to the conclusion the rototiller needed a whole new set of oil seals. Well, to get to the oil seals, we have to disassemble things. And disassembling, look at what we found. All this mouse lint and garbage. Also more mouse lint and garbage up here. Had we even tried to start this thing in that condition, we'd have probably had a fire. So we didn't do it, and we're going through and cleaning everything up. It's going to get what I call a practical restoration, meaning that we are not going to be redoing everything. We're going to redo the oil seals or as we take things apart. We'll paint them up and fix them up to go through and look for anything else wrong. Of course, we're going to change out the oil, etc. One of the nice things, though, is this part here is the dog clutch, and you have your fan right around it because it's air-cooled, but the engine is completely, completely free. Just turns over beautifully. Now, of course, I have the spark plug out, so it turns that easy. Otherwise, I couldn't have done that. We found, for example, in the gas tank that the gas tank was clean, but it was plugged up on the outlet side, and it was its fuel filter system, which is on the back, this little fuel bowl, happened to have a problem with it. We had to make a new gasket for it. We had to make a little handle for its shutoff. The handle was completely missing. So we made a little handle shutoff back here. We had to repair the muffler. There was so much mouse lint, etc., inside of certain parts of this. Had we started it, we'd have had a fire. So as you can see so far, we've gone through, and it's not just about painting. Every seal has been replaced and we have made minor changes from original. It's the original colors, 
but the bolts, etc., I am going through and plating them in zinc because those are items you may have to do work on at various times undo, and I don't really want to constantly be chipping up paint, even though we're actually going to use the rototiller to rototill and put in the bricks as we showed you in the other video, and she'll probably put that up for those who are wondering, what was the other video about in case you missed it? When the camera comes around this side, I want to show you something in particular that's interesting. That's the original tag. I've just cleaned it up and polished it. It was not painted. It was actually that way on the Graham Page Rototiller. That's its original build tag right there with all the patents that this particular rototiller was built under. We're getting close on it. We've got to do the tines, the handle yet, but this is coming pretty close, and we will show you how it operates and starts in the future. And at that time, we'll do a history video that really gives you the history on this particular rototiller and the fact that it was the first and possibly best rototiller that has ever been made. Here we are up in the machine shop, or at least that's what I call it. I have all these special machines and parts and things I work with. And we have a supercharger here that belongs to a customer. So lest you think we just do our own things, no, we don't. Most of the time anymore, I'm actually spending time working on customers' projects. This particular supercharger, by the time we're done, is going to have been the most extensive restoration, most difficult restoration, and unfortunately most expensive, which we're going to explain why. This particular supercharger is now made from two superchargers. The first one, the owners from the Midwest sent, turned out to be frozen, which generally is not too bad, except this one was frozen because it had been run without oil which made it nearly impossible to take apart. Once we got it apart, we found out why it was so hard. The bearings had been melted, at least in the bottom portion of it. As a consequence, we had to use components from the second supercharger he sent out to actually build this portion. Right now, we're still missing our top seal. We now CNC the top seals, brand new ones, and we're waiting for that from the machine shop that does that for me. I'm having four made right now because believe it or not, I've got four superchargers either here, well, three are here, one on the way to do, including this one. Now, the other thing that makes this one super expensive is it's a Hollywood supercharger and he didn't have a good top, partly because he thought he did. And I'm holding in my hand here one that looks like, oh my, that looks like a really nice supercharger top. It looks really good. Except when you flip it over, there are all these little marks, and there were actually marks here, here, and here also. And what was found is when you would weld this aluminum, you'd clean it up, the area that you welded is fine, but at the edges of where you weld, it then goes to leak, because every one of these marks was a leak. And what it turns out is the interior of the superchargers is electrolyzed so much that it's basically paper thin, and this top turned out to be, for all practical purposes, unrestorable. After trying in three areas, we decided this was not going to work. It was going to keep happening, so we gave up on using this one. But when we got another top that the owner sent to us, the top there in this area, which we'll show you a different photograph of it, but in this area was had been welded up with an adapter and totally screwed up. This whole area is totally screwed up on it. We're also going to show you a photograph that shows what we've done to restore it, where we've got it back looking original. It was a tremendous amount of work between aluminum welding, machining, and in hours and hours of handwork to restore this area to where it looks like it was originally done and cast. We're now currently, and the reason I'm showing you with this one is it's currently sent out for aluminum welding again. We're working on this portion of that top because it turns out that it was poorly, improperly welded in the past by whoever worked on it, and they'd also machined it down so that this flange was too small. So now we're working on this area, but we didn't even want to start here until we had completely completed that section. All in all, we're doing the most extensive restoration we've ever done on a supercharger top ever, and the reality is, is if it had been a regular top, of which I have many spares, I'd have just supplied a spare for the owner instead of fixing it, but the Hollywood tops are so rare, we're fixing the Hollywood top that he needs for his car.
So here we are with the special feature. This is a 1946 Belanca airplane. On the channel, a long time ago, we did one video that had to do with the airplane. This is another one of the restoration projects I have. And during the recent time, hadn't been out at the airport because they've been building a terminal. And it made it kind of miserable to be here with all the dirt, et cetera, construction equipment, so I hadn't been out here working on the airplane. We are currently engaged in working on the landing gear, at which time we will be able to finish up the last little bit on this wing, which is off and upside down, and be able to put the wing back on and put the landing gear on the airplane. We'll uncover it just a little bit, so you can kind of get an idea that we've got a lot of parts off of it right now. Most of those parts have been completed. They're sitting in the back of the hangar. We've only got four pieces, not having to do with the landing gear, just four pieces that have to do with the rest of the airplane that need to be painted or finished. Now we'll take you around and show you the inside of the cockpit and its current condition. So now you can look inside the entire instrument panel, all the instruments, all the tags everywhere. We've redone everything in there, including finding correct yokes because somebody else had cut the yokes down. It's still in need of its radios, and we will put the rest of the interior back in it when we do the exterior assembly, which needs to be done first. But it gives you an idea that that's pretty much done already. We have to do final little fabric work here, very minor fabric repair. Now the reason this has all been done and the reason the wings are off, or this wing still, is because this airplane had been dumped in a ditch by the former owner at a small airport in Ohio. So we disassembled it, brought it out here to Arizona to fix it, and the reason it had been dumped in a ditch was quite simple. He was doing a high-speed taxi test and decided partway down the runway to shut off the engine but he couldn't stop the airplane in time and he literally dumped it in the ditch. And he damaged a few things, made some damage to the bottom of the wings, damaged a couple of landing gear pieces, messed up the old prop. So we're gonna show you the new prop that we've got for it that we had custom made. Here is our brand new Sensenich prop that we got. We had to order it through Wag Arrow. That's the only way it could be done. And it is a beautiful wooden prop here. You can see it's all handmade out of wood and it is the only prop that we're aware of currently being made that fits the Franklin engine because it's a Franklin air-cooled engine on this airplane. You can see this tip over here. I don't want to take it out of the packaging because it's protecting it but it's absolutely beautiful with a beautiful brass tip on it. Just gorgeous and fairly pricey to get one of those made. About $3,000 but it's the only way to get a prop for this airplane. Back here, we have some of the latest parts that have been finished for this airplane. The nose bowl, the door, these are the fairings that go from the fuselage to the wing. And underneath all these points back here, we've got the rest of the parts. We're currently working on the main landing gear, which is not at the hangar. We had to have a couple things welded, and we've been working on the problem of the rubber donuts in the landing gear to properly seal them up. 